Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Uh, today, I have Nita Sweeney. She's the author of a book called Depression Hates a Moving Target. So, uh, Nita, thank you for coming. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. I'm always grateful to have these conversations, so thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. Tell me a bit about your background. What led you to uh, to writing this book? And, you know, unfortunately, it's probably a, a bout with depression, I guess, yourself or someone you know. Go ahead. Yeah, so I've had chronic depression probably most of my adult life, but it got a lot worse in 1994. I was practicing law, and I ended up leaving my job because of a major depressive episode. I was suicidal hospitalized, ended up gratefully on medication, and then really spent the next couple of decades, you know, cycling on and off meds and trying to write, which is what my dream had been. And then eventually in 2010, I saw the social media post of a high school friend who was, by then I had gained a lot of weight and she was about the same size as I was. She was my same age. And she posted Call me crazy, but this running is getting to be fun. And I thought she surely lost her mind because I just did not think of running as fun. But mm -hmm. I kept watching her posts and there was something about that. I was at a place in my life. I'd had a year where a whole bunch of loved ones died. I was unsuccessful in getting a book published. I'd been through MFA school and you know, I published a few articles, one, a poetry, you know, I'd done some things that, that were successful, but I just felt like I couldn't get any traction and my mood was so bad. And something about her post made me think, if she can do this, so can I. And so I started running. And the book is about that journey from bon bon eating overweight woman on sofa, suicidal and very, very unhappy, you know, to the point of not being sure I wanted to live to someone who still has mental health issues but runs regularly, lives a very good life. You know, I want to live now, which I wasn't sure I did then. Got a book published, which doesn't happen to everybody who runs. I'm not making that promise, but that's what happened to me. And it's about, you know, taking exercise as a tool in the kit and adding that in, which was the big thing that was missing. So what do you, what do you think caused you to uh, fall into depression and anxiety? And like, when did it start for you? How far back can you remember? And do you know what precipitated it? Well, I think that it's genetic in my family. My mother was probably undiagnosed bipolar. She was alcoholic. She didn't die sober. She got sober. But I grew up in a house where there was never fewer than four cases of long neck Budweiser's either in the you know refrigerator or the refrigerator in the barn or in the corner. And we just, people just drank. That's what they did. And I think that's how they medicated 
their emotions and their mental health issues. And also her father, my mother's father, had, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know the history completely, but he had tremors. It might have been familial tremens. It could have been alcoholic withdrawal tremens. We don't know. But he had a prefrontal lobotomy in the 50s and died in the state hospital as a result of that. So there's this history in my family, especially on my mother's side, of mental health and things going really bad, badly with that. And so I remember as a child just being sad a lot of the time. I mean, I had some joy too. I had some fun, but a lot of just this sort of low level melancholy. And that continued to get worse as I got older. And I really kind of crashed in, like I said, the mid nineties when I was practicing law and it was between the stress and my inability to cope with it. I wasn't getting any kind of help for my anxiety or my depression. And until I got that help, I, you know, I just, I just couldn't manage my life. So it was really with me for a very long time. And I kind of thought that's who I was. You know, I sort of thought that's just the way it would always be. And, and so, like I said, I had some good periods, but it's really kind of been with me all my life. And I, like I said, I still have mental health issues. It's not like it magically went away, but having a full toolkit, having therapy and meds, and I also do meditation and a physical activity I love, a community of support has made all the difference, just a huge difference in my life. So you you said you saw posts from uh, you know a former classmate and the idea of running to cold and then like how did you start you know what what was it like when you first started the first day or two when you tried to run it was ridiculous i was scared that my neighbors who weren't even home because it was a weekday in our suburban neighborhood were going to laugh at me if they saw me running trying to run at my size you know i had these probably giant pink sweatpants and a green top nothing matched nothing Nothing matched my idea of what a runner should look like. I had big clunky shoes because I didn't really have exercise shoes. They were tennis shoes, but they were, you know, just these giant shoes. And so I took our yellow Labrador retriever, Morgan, kind of as a decoy. I mean, I walked him from time to time, but I thought, okay, they'll think I'm just going to walk the dog. And I took a digital kitchen timer down into a ravine that's kind of a hidden area in our neighborhood where the lots are really long and they slope down. So people can't really see you in that part of this little, it's like a quarter mile stretch of a wooded area where it's, it's pretty secluded. And I had watched the, um, or I had gone onto the couch to 5k website, which is what I found out she was following. And it's, oh, it was called couch to 5k. That's really cool. Right. Right. That's what, that's a, it's a very, it's an app now at the time you could go to a website and you could print off the schedule. This was like I said, 2010. And I, so I saw that it said 60 seconds of jogging. It did not say running. And I'm sure it said other things besides 60 seconds of jogging, but something about that seemed completely manageable. I thought, okay, I can jog for 60 seconds. And so I took the digital timer and the dog down into the ravine and I stood there for a while until the dog got bored and got up and, you know, like peed on a bush or something. And and I realized this is ridiculous. You got to do this. And so I turned on that timer and I jogged for 60 seconds and something about doing that, it just lifted my mood, even in that just little bit of time. And then there was, you know, a walk interval and then a little more jogging and then a walk interval. I think the whole workout was maybe 10, 15 minutes, something like that. But it was the most physical activity I had managed in many, many years. And it just shifted something inside me. And it took me a while to tell anybody that I was doing it. So uh, the plan is that you run what you work out. You do like a run-walk interval for three days a week. And it's supposed to be a nine week plan, but it took me much longer. And so I didn't tell anybody, even my husband, I've been, we had been married at least 20 years by then. And I didn't even tell him because I had just tried so many different things over the years. You know, we had the, I don't know if we had a treadmill, but we had various pieces of equipment that became clothes racks in the basement and the mini trampoline and the, you know, gym memberships and all the things that I had tried at different points. And so I didn't tell him until it felt as if this was going to stick, as if I was actually going to continue with this. And then eventually I did tell him. Yeah. 
I did tell him. It was like, how long, you know, it was how long were you? Oh, about a month, and then you maybe, finally told your husband. Yeah, maybe my mid six weeks. It was. It was. It took a while because I. I just wasn't sure that I could stick with it. I was just so despondent a lot of the time. Before we continue. I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now, back to the show. If so, you talk to him about that time, did he, you would think he would be, but I mean, it, was, he, was he aware of how you were feeling and oh, you yeah. know, when you were doing this, like, did he notice before you told him or no? Yeah, I think he knew that something was a little bit different, but he didn't, he just knows not to say anything because he knows that any kind of pressure, I turn that so harshly onto myself that pretty much just doesn't say anything. And he was in a job where um, I think at that time he, he was a CFO of a um, nonprofit, might've been director of finance, but of a nonprofit that was really struggling. And so he was trying to turn it around. So he was very busy in his own job and, and uh, very focused on that. But yeah, he, I'm sure he knew something was up, but it wasn't, it wasn't obvious what it was. And I was always trying things. And so he kind of knew to wait until I was ready to talk about it. And then his comment was be an interval runner. No, don't. He was really afraid I would just go completely overboard. Cause that's the other thing I do is go completely overboard, which I kind of did, but it kind of worked, <laughs> which is kind of funny because, you know, sometimes it does work when you go completely overboard, but he was just hoping that I wouldn't burn myself out on it. And gratefully I didn't, I gradually progressed. And the book talks a lot about the, I had physical issues and I had emotional issues and I had anxiety and all of that comes up. I mean, it's not like you can run away from that when you have that. So the book is about me facing all of those things as I continued to run and how that it, it, changed it, my perspective. Yeah, maybe, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to make this into like a pun, but in a way it, it may be appropriate. Were you literally running away from what was bothering you or did you feel like you were running towards what was bothering you? Did that happen at all or you were just running? It Okay, it felt to me as if I was running toward health especially mental health. I knew that I wanted to lose weight. I, you know, was a much larger size than I'd ever been in my life. And I knew that running burned a ton of calories. So there was that, but emotionally it felt as if I was running toward some kind of stability, some kind of a up mood lifting activity that could sustain me at least for a little while, because it That's really, excellent. really, it really felt as if things were untenable. I mean, if something didn't change, I'm not sure I'd be here. I mean, I just was really ready to give up. Yeah. The reason I ask you is I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just supposing, but that probably made it more likely for you to continue because you were running towards something instead of running away from something. Yes, I agree. And it's, you know, that's such a common joke is like, what are you running from? I mean, I, people say that all the time and there's great memes about animals watching people run and saying, what are they running from? You know? And, um, and yes, I mean, you're sort of running from your troubles in a way, but I think if I had just been running solely to lose weight, cause I had done that before when I was much, much younger and I don't call it running. I call what I was doing then sprinting and it didn't work at all and it didn't last, but you're right. There's something about going towards something and feeling as if I'm headed in a direction to something as opposed to thinking something's chasing me and I'll you know, have to get away from it. But I, I don't know. I, at the time I wasn't that aware of it. It was much more of a feeling thing. I had started dreaming and I thought that I was dreaming that I was flying, but I realized after it was a recur recurrent dream, I realized after a while that I was actually dreaming that I was running. And of course I was dreaming that I was running much faster than I actually run, but there was this sensation of sort of floating through space. It was relatively effortless. And I, and it dawned on me that I could run slowly and it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel like I was, you know, killing myself. I mean, yeah, you do 
get out of breath and you do exert yourself. It's not effortless. But there was something about that floating feeling that, I mean, maybe it's the runner's high. I'm not sure because I do get that from time to time. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. But uh, yeah, the, but, the so reason I ask is, yeah. um, yeah, the reason I ask is, you know, I guess a lot of behaviors are characterized as avoidance behaviors, you know, like drinking alcohol or drugs or, you know, whatever other addictions. And it seems like universally, they're always described as getting rid or getting away from or trying to cover over. But running, I mean, I guess literally because you're you're running and you said you're running towards health, like it was different. It wasn't an avoidance behavior. It was literally, and you were running towards something positive. So for some reason it just sticks out at me, the difference. Yes. I, I think you're right. I, I'm, I haven't thought of it quite that way before, but it definitely, I mean, there is an addictive quality to it. Definitely the way that I do it. I mean, I run an ultra marathon, which is 31, 31 miles. I've run three fulls, 20, 29 halves and 18 seats. So there's definitely an obsessive quality to it that I enjoy it and want to continue it. And, you know, I do a lot of races and I do a lot of training, but I don't, I don't think that if I had just tried to not be depressed and not added something that that works. I think you have to, you can't like take, it's sort of like with addiction. They talk about how you can't just stop drinking or stop using. You have to replace it with something that gives you the positive sensations that you got when drinking and, and you know, drugging used to work. Eventually it stops working, but it, you know, when it used to work and that's the way it was with me for depression, all the things that I had tried, including medication, I was still on many, many medications. In fact, running helped me get off some of them I'm still on one, but you can't just say, okay, you have to stop being depressed and we're going to just have nothing. And so having the, for me, it was exercise as a replacement to, I don't know what, but that somehow it made it a positive as opposed to thinking, okay, I have to, I have to get rid of this other thing. And I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm making sense there, but it definitely it's felt okay. like it was, okay. it was, it was, it was more like a positive thing for me as opposed to, and, and, cool. and part of it was because I was older. I already knew I was never going to win a 5k. <laughs> I wasn't going to go, I wasn't qualifying for Boston. There, that wasn't going to happen for me because of some issues I talk about in the book, physical issues, but that it was going to be about my emotional state that was going to be the main reason I did it and um and so I think I didn't have quite the maybe and maybe it's my personality too I didn't have quite the obsessive tendency that maybe other people have I'm not sure because I definitely people seeing people go with running to very unhealthy extremes what was your mindset you know when I don't know if you can remember but when you were about to run on a given day were you in a bad way were you in a good way? Like, what was a cue that, that got you to run each day? Did you just pick a specific time or was it more like, I feel this way, I'm going to go run now? No, it was more, I feel this way and I'm going to go run now. And the feel this way was, I feel brave enough to go run now. And sometimes I didn't feel brave enough, but I knew if I get started, I'll feel brave. I'll, the, the getting started. Because, I mean, I still have days where I it's the brain is just so tricky and uh, I still have days. I mean, I've run thousands of miles and I have, I have days I'll get up in the morning and my brain will say to me, well, that running was fun, but you know, I think those days are over. I mean, just, I mean, totally out of the blue. And I mean, I'll go, I'll sit up in bed and laugh and think, what, where does that even come from? Because I'm going to get up and run 12 miles or something. It's just, it's just so crazy, but that's the mind. And the meditation helps with that too, because I can see that I'm not that thought. That thought is just arising in consciousness and I can just watch it arise, do this little dance and pass away. And I had been meditating for many, many years. And I think that may have helped also because when I would get up in the morning and I had the schedule, I printed out the schedule. It was on the end of the bookcase. And I would get up in the morning and if it was one of the days I was supposed to run, I usually looked forward to it. And then as it was time, you know, some of it was weather, as it was time to get closer to run, I might start getting anxious and then have to talk myself into it. But I'd notice those thoughts. Oh, this is going to be too hard. You really shouldn't be doing this. The neighbors will be home today and they'll laugh. All of those thoughts. And I was kind of able to say, okay. Those are just the thoughts and let them pass or even thank them because that part of the mind thinks it's trying to save me. I mean, it really does. It thinks that whatever I'm going to do is dangerous and scary. And I really, 
shouldn't be doing it. And so, you know, see, it's a very reptilian or whatever part of the mind, I guess. And so I tried to just notice and let the thought pass and keep moving, <laughs> you know, put on my shoes. And, and sometimes I say that, Nita, just put on your shoes or just go outside, just get dressed and go outside. And eventually, if you stand there long enough, you realize, well, maybe the neighbors are looking at you because you've been standing here for 10 minutes in your front lawn. Um, you know, and, and it's like, okay, we'll just jog down the road and see how it goes. So I still, even mm -hmm. all these years later, I have to, I sometimes still have to talk myself into it. But in those early days, I quickly gained a momentum from having a schedule to follow, from continuing to watch my friend. She was, by then she was months ahead of me because I didn't do it right away. It took me a while to, you know, to, to pick up that plan and, and, um, and do it. And there was sort of the excitement of something new and the momentum from that pulled me in much more than it does now, all these years later, where it's the same training plan. I might be running in a different state or a different race or something like that, but it's not quite the same newness as it was at the beginning. So what, what, um, so you're describing what, what's going on in your head as you're getting ready to go out and then. When you were actually starting to run, uh, what was the first minute or two of the running like mentally? Like what are, I know <laughs> well, it's well, mentally, every time, Yes, yeah. that very first couple of minutes mentally, I realized that I really needed a better running bra. <laughs> Literally, that was it. I realized, so, oh my gosh, you had, you're wearing a bra that's probably 10 years old. You know, because it's an athletic bra, and I didn't, I hadn't run in a while, especially at this larger weight. And so it was, it was almost comical because all the anxiety dropped away. And suddenly I was completely in my body, which is a very meditative thing to do. And, um, and I had to laugh and I thought, yeah, you, your, your next trip is to a running store <laughs> because you need to take care of this. And, but then, then what happened is that ravine ends at the top of a hill. You turn a corner and there's the top of the hill. And then suddenly I was out in the neighborhood and I had to choose, okay, am I going to go out where they can see me? or not. And I turned around and went back down in the ravine. And I did that. I don't know. I, I can't, you know, I don't have a, I have a journal of, of how far I went and what days. I mean, I can tell you it was like, it was March the 23rd, 2010 was the very first thing. And, but I don't have the log of when I actually left the ravine because some, you know, some, at some point a day came where I got to the top of that hill at the end of the ravine. And I thought, this is it. You're going to, are you going to run in the ravine for the rest of your life? This quarter mile back and forth, back and forth. And, uh, and so I stepped out into the neighborhood and, and it seems like such a little thing, you know, you're just in the ravine and then you're in a neighborhood. What we do. But for me, it was huge. It was huge because I had kind of a, I don't know what the term is, but it's kind of an agoraphobic thing, but it's more of a maybe social anxiety, self-consciousness um, about my weight my were you ever worried that. you couldn't get back home or you'd have oh. to walk home because you would lose all your you know your reserve and be like oh and then well, have to walk. i wasn't yeah but i was less than a quarter mile from my house so it wasn't <laughs> that was not really and i was and and i was running in a circle so i would be headed back toward my house pretty quickly but um i did think yes i did wonder if i would always, no matter how minimal the distance increase was, I always was convinced that I couldn't do it. Even if it was um, something like, today I ran a quarter mile and tomorrow I'm going to run 0.35. I mean, it, that even that tiny distance, if it was anything more than what I'd ever done, it just played with my brain. So that was always, and there was always, yes, the the chance that I would have to walk home. But I think, I think even because I was already in my neighborhood and I did sometimes already walk my dog, I wasn't as self-conscious about walking the dog home. I mean, I would know inside myself that I had felt like I failed, but nobody else would. Whereas them seeing me try to run or try to jog, that's the thing that I was so self-conscious about it. So again, tricky mind playing these games that when I step back, make no logical sense. But that's the thing about the mind is it's not playing logically. It's coming at us from 
either disordered places, disordered places, you know, cognitive where, you know, that's just a, it's just like a twisted way of thinking, or it could be a part that is still about three years old. That's kind of in charge all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, if you follow the family therapy, family dynamics, I forget what the name of that is, but, but, you know, all those, all those kinds of things. So there's all these things that work in the mind. And so that's why the meditation really help is because I can step back and, just sort of let it like watch it do its play its little game and then realize well, what, that right, it, will pass. So, it will pass. So you were incorporating some meditative elements into the run itself as you ran? Yeah, not intentionally, but because I am a meditator and had been meditating already. See, by then I probably had been meditating for about 15 years. It's just natural to know that that's the way the mind works. I was able to step back and say, oh, that's what's going on with my mind. Now, sometimes in the moment, I couldn't do that. And in the moment, I would be paralyzed, especially when it came to bridges. I have had a thing about bridges at the time. And But when I would step back, especially after it was over, I would think, oh, that's what happened. And But yes, I was always trying to, I was always incorporating meditation, but sometimes I didn't realize it. It's just sort of who I am because I've been practicing so long. So while you were running, did you literally start to feel better or lighter as you ran? Or when you stopped running and you were finished for that day? Did you feel changed by it? Like what was, and did you revert after an hour or so? Like what was, what was the feeling part of it like before, well, the, during, and after? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I was completely conscious of it. What, what I noticed that was the biggest change is I had always needed to take a nap in the afternoon, no matter what. And so the first day I did take a nap after I ran. And then the second day, I think I did. But then the third day I got in bed to lie down and I couldn't sleep. I just, it was like, I, oh, I'm not really that tired. And so I got up and, you know, and there would be sometimes I would take a nap, but that level of just constantly needing to regroup all day long started to go away. And so I had more energy and I did notice during the run, because I was doing intervals, especially there was this huge joy from finishing an interval, whether it was 60 seconds or then expands to 90 seconds. And then it's like two minutes and, you know, you'd finish this run, whatever the tiny interval interval that it increased was just very incremental. And I'd feel this joy, like, oh my God, I just did that. I just did that. And, um, you know, so yeah, that was always kind of happening during the run. And then afterwards, there was just this sense of accomplishment. Oh, yeah. So the other thing that I did was I had printed off the schedule, the training schedule, the Catch to 5K schedule. And I would come home and I'd be able to check off that little workout I had just done. And that's a dopamine hit. And so I'd have this positive sensations, these pleasant thoughts of, I just did that. I just did a thing and I accomplished it. And yeah, I think about it now and it it almost seems ridiculous, but I know that you have to keep it in perspective because I was so depressed that I didn't want to live. So being able to check something off a schedule like that was enough to keep me going for another day. And did you ever feel that the running contributed to your depression or anxiety or it only helped it? The only time that it think, I think it always helped it. It always helped it. There were a few times once I started racing where maybe I had really hoped to do better in a race and, you know, things just go wrong sometimes. And so I would be disappointed, but it wasn't the same as the depression. There was not, it, it always was a mood lifter. I mean, it still is. It still is. If I want to feel better, just put on my shoes and go. It really will help. It maybe take a mile. You know, that first mile might be agony. They always say the first mile is a liar. And, but, uh, and once I get out there, I'm usually always happy, especially if I can go outside. What would you do when uh, the weather wasn't good or, you know, it was well, cold I, or hot or there's precipitation? What'd you do? Yeah, you run. So if when, if it rains, you know, people, they ask, well, what do runners do when it rains? It's like, we get wet. And what, do runners do when it's cold? Well, we get cold. You know, what do they do when it's hot? Well, we get hot. So yeah, I pretty much, I've run in, I think the coldest I've run in is, I think that the feels like was six below. So it's probably about three degrees. And the hottest I've run in is in the nineties. I don't think I've run over. I don't think I've run over a hundred. I'm in central Ohio. It gets very hot and humid. I think the feels like might've been over a hundred, but you have to be careful with uh, hydration, especially in the summer. You have to make sure you're getting enough electrolytes like salt and stuff with the water. And I've learned 
from having a running community how to do all of that how to you know to do all the kind of things that support the running but yeah and then do, I, do you run I, a do you run alone or did you get a partner or a group at some uh, point well yeah i i ran alone for a while and then i joined an online group where it was just a discussion kind of like a it was the same group that the couch to 5k was in it was like active.com or something like that and so um so i did that sort of online so i wasn't i was still running alone but i had people i was talking to about these things you know do you carry water how do you do that what do you you know how much how long do you go before you drink water all those kinds of questions so i was getting all of that stuff answered and then eventually I joined a group called Marathoner in Training here in Central Ohio that is sponsored by our local Fleet Feet store because I wanted to run longer distances. But I ran alone for probably about a year and a half. And I know tons of people that have run alone for years. That's just the way they prefer it. And what's interesting is I, I, I run in the group, but I'm not necessarily I don't like to be in the little pack. So I'll usually run behind them or in front of them. Just I'm sort of an off the scale introvert. And so I get, I do better when I'm not in the middle of the chatter, especially at, you know, 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, which I call the middle of the night. And uh, so I'm with them. So we have water stops. And if anything happens, there's people there. If I do want to talk, there's people there. People ask questions. There's always a trainer, like a PT person in case something happens and you need to talk to them about how to deal with an injury. So they have a whole lot of support that you get from this group, but a lot of the miles I run alone, just me and the dog. That's what we do. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's where the training really happens. It's just me and the dog on our, well, as you've so, interacted with other people that have, you know, gone to exercise to help them with their, you know, their mental issues. Is it usually running that people do? Is that the number one exercise or are there other ones that, you know, for some reason you just don't do, you like running better, but they also work or seem to work for a lot of people. Oh, I think it's any movement form. I don't really know. I mean, it would be really interesting if there's been some, you know, some research on that. I'm not really sure. I tend to follow running research science. There's a number of kind of uh, exercise scientists that I follow and most of them that I follow study running just because that's what I'm interested. But I really, the, the, the things that I have read is that it's about breaking a sweat. It doesn't have to be a, a huge sweat, but just raising your heart rate enough that you get out of just the, the regular zone that, you know, you're just sitting in your chair kind of zone. So it could be walking. Um, it could be dance. It could be lifting weights. It could be swimming. I mean, I, I really believe that any movement, the, the most important thing to me is that you find something you enjoy so that you'll continue doing it. So it's not just, oh, I have to do this for my mental health or I have to do this for my physical health. I want to do this. I look forward to doing this. For some people, that's community. They need the social aspect. One of my neighbors here plays tennis and she loves being with her tennis people. And, you know, they talk tennis and they play together and then they do things together. And for me, it's the running group. We talk running, but I'm not sure that it's just running. I mean, they, they joke that running is such a simple sport, which technically you just need a decent pair of shoes. And if you're a woman, you probably need a running bra, but, uh, you know, you can kind of do it in t-shirts and shorts and it's not a big deal. And I, we always joke about that as I you know, have on my very expensive Garmin watch and my tech shirt and my tech shorts and my fancy sun hat and my uh, wraparound glasses <laughs> are simple sport but you don't have to have all that you can just go out your door and jog that's it so again while you're running is that when you do you feel a shift or a change after a period of time or is it after you run that's when you really feel like the biggest benefits of it and how long does it last so it it takes getting warmed up which for me is about a mile and then I start to feel better. It also depends. I mean, if I'm doing speed work, that's not necessarily a lot of fun. Once in a while, if you're trying to train for a particular distance, some of us will do what's called speed work, where you really push yourself, you choose a particular distance, and then you run kind of as hard as you can for that distance. And then you rest, walk back, run again, or hill repeats. We do that where you run as hard as you can up the hill and then walk down then hard as you can up the hill. That's not you know, you don't get kind of the same, there's a, there's a pleasure and an accomplishment from it, but it's not the same as like long, slow miles. That's what I kind of like long, slow distance. They call it LSD, long, slow distance. And about after a mile, I start to feel that just sensation. And then afterwards, there's definitely a glow for a couple of hours, but I feel good for a couple of days. 
I'll just feel better. Cause like during a week, if I have maybe a cold or if I've tweaked a muscle and so I really shouldn't run for a little while, I mean, I notice it after a few days and when I haven't run, I definitely notice that my mood's slipping a little bit. It's not ever been anywhere near what it was running, but you know, but it's, it's definitely does drop a little bit. And then there's this whole panic thing, which we have to talk ourselves down from, because again, the tricky mind will say, oh dear, your running days are over, or, you know, you're going to weigh 400 pounds in a week because you can't run for a week. I mean, the mind really does play these crazy games that are ridiculous, but I know that now. Oh, when you, we when kind you of joke can't about run, it. Yes. Like can't I can't run I, for a day or so, like all of a sudden well, you start for more than a yeah, catastrophizing. That's actually a word I was looking for earlier. That I, but like I tore my meniscus, which it was a silly thing. I just stepped wrong. It wasn't even about running. I just, I mean, you can tear your meniscus just standing still practically if you, well, step wrong. And that's what happened. I stepped wrong and I, I just, it's not a huge tear. It's just a, like a tiny little tear. Most people have tiny tears in their meniscus, but it was enough that it caused inflammation. And so I had to uh, stay off it for, I think about six weeks. I had to stay off of it. So that really, really kind of um, did a number on my mind thinking, oh, will I ever be able to run again? Or this is awful. I'm going to lose all my fitness. I'm going to gain a ton of weight. And none of that happened. You know, I was able to run again. That's been now, I think, five years and it's just fine. But have you ever tried to um, to meditate and in like the theater of your mind, picture yourself running and like go for a run in your mind? Have you ever tried that? Well, that kind of happens sometimes. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not as good at visualization. That's more of a visualization practice. I'm not, I'm not as good as visualization. What works better for me is to just stay completely in the moment and remind myself, you're not running now. You're, you're not running yet. You're not running today. You know, I just, and completely stay in the moment because my, the catastrophizing mind is in the future. And so if I can bring myself back to now that works a lot better because what happens when I visualize is it doesn't go well. I have trouble visualizing positive scenarios. Some people do that where I think uh, uh, Dina Castor writes in her book, let your mind run um, about visualizing, you know, winning, visualizing, crossing the finish line, visualizing. Well, I start to do that. And then my mind finds a pothole for me to step in and, break my leg in four places and then the ambulance is coming and then you know I'm in the hospital it was like my mind just doesn't do that at all and so the best and and again we're all different everybody's there's a guy I think it was George Sheehan that said we're all an ex- we're each an experiment of one and so we each have to find what works for us so for me I'm better if I can say I'm not running today I'm not running now and that way I'm not thinking and I'll never run again you know that's it's that's that's the part that I have to bring it back to to now for me. But that works for a lot of people. I know a lot of people that have great success with visualizing themselves, you know, speeding across the finish line and mile 20, mile 19, mile 21 in a marathon, they call it the wall. That tends to be a bad place. So people visualize themselves, you know, being strong through those miles and not having any problem and things like that. And and my mind just doesn't work that way. So what, what prompted you to write this book? And how has it been received? What kind of comments have you gotten from? Mostly I've gotten positive comments. Every once in a while, I'll get a comment from someone who I can tell does not have any mental health issues. And so they see the ridiculousness of my mind, but they can't relate. And so those are the only kinds of negative comments I get. Usually I get comments like you were in my head it felt like you were in my head <laughs> which is exactly what i wanted but what really prompted me to write the book is i you know i'm just a writer that's what i do that's what i've been doing for years and i have sort of been trying to get various books published over the years one memoir about the last couple of years, the last months my father was alive i tried to publish and wasn't successful and that was actually what was happening before i started running before i discovered that this was helpful to me and So I was always writing. I was always writing something. And I always kept, and I still do, keep a log, which is almost like a journal. After every run, I record what dogs I saw, you know, how it felt, uh, what shoes I wore, how far we went, how fast we went or how slow, 
Were there leaves on the ground? Did I see any deer? You know, all those kinds of things, very sensory detail things, especially. I wrote those down because you tend to not be able to remember those later. And oh, what, what does do. that do for I you to do. write that down? Like, do it's you review it a, after the yeah, run? Well, yeah, that's what that's what it is. It's I, I write it after the run and it's a way to relive it in a way, but also to notice, you know, it helps me while I'm running to notice the sensory details, notice the things that are out there, because I know I'm going to write them down. And I just am a journaler. I just, uh, I'm a compiler. That's what I do. And so I wrote all that. So I had all that going. And then I had started writing about my running experience because after I started telling people about it, people would say, you just really seem different. And they would, <laughs> they would ask me things like, did you get your hair cut? Or what's different? You know, are you seeing a different therapist? I mean, really, they would say things like that, my close, close friends. And I would say, well, the only thing that I've really changed is I've started running. And then eventually I started losing weight. People would notice that. And I just felt that there was a story in middle-aged woman takes up running. Well, as time went on and I started, I, I don't know, kind of revising it and looking at it from a different perspective, and especially after they reduced my meds. So, I mean, I was on, at one point I was on six meds. I think I was on four when I started running and now I'm on one and had been on one for many years. And I realized that this was more than just about running. And so it started as a book about middle-aged woman runs marathon and it end up, ended up as a suicidal woman decides to live or a, you know, a woman runs to save her life. That's more the story that ended up in the book. And that's why, that's why, that's, you know, that's not necessarily why I wrote it because I just write, that's kind of what I do, but that's why Mango picked it up. That's why the publisher picked it up is because it had that mental health angle that was a little different than your typical running story. Pretty much everybody who runs has a story of, there's a reason I do this and it's bigger than just running. I mean, it, most people have that story, but I was able to you. articulate it. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's cool. So present day, where are you at with, um, you know, with the work you're doing? Are you, are you, do you feel like you're going to continue to contribute to mental health and understanding or where do you want to go from here with your work? Well, I will always be a mental health advocate. I think I've actually been one for a long time, but I joke that when the book was published, it turned me into an accidental mental health advocate because I hadn't been as vocal about it. And now, you know, that's all I talk about. But a meditation is really been foundational for me. I mean, almost 30 years now, 25 years at least, maybe almost 30 years. And so I'm hoping to incorporate that into everything I do. And I'm in contract right now for a new book about making movement of any kind into a meditative practice using mindfulness techniques when you are running, when you're dancing, when you're lifting weights, when you're swimming, when you're you know doing Zumba, whatever, uh, playing tennis. Because the thing that happens with most people when they're exercising is they are already having the level of focus and we call it equanimity, but it's a sort of a mind state, a calm mind state that happens naturally, especially in intense exercise, but can happen in, it can happen in more gentle exercise too, if you're intentional about it. And so I want to train people how to do that. And so I have a I have a contract right now to write a book that's supposed to come out in the fall. The, the working title is Make Every Move a Meditation, Mindful Movement for Mental Health and Well-Being. And there's a real strong connection between movement and mental health and meditation and mental health. And so I'm combining those two. This is nothing new. These are ancient practices that have been done for thousands of years, but I'm bringing them into the mainstream and, you know, taking a lot of the kind of lingo way and making about walking your dog and, you know, going to the park and playing with your children and things like that. Okay. Well, excellent. Well, Nito, when, um, so for your existing book, Depression Aids a Moving Target, where can people get it? And then what are, what's another resource or two for them in closing? So the book is available wherever fine books are sold. I love to say that. That's what my editor told me to say. But seriously, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Indie Books, um, any place that you like to buy books, you can find it. It's probably available at your library. It's just Depression Hates a Moving Target. You can go to my website, nitasweeney.com. It's N-I-T-A-S-W-E-E-N-E-Y.com. I don't know if there'll be probably show notes with that. And if you go to my website, there's also another resource called Three Ways to Heal Your Mind, which is a downloadable ebook that has, that talks about some of the tools that I use 
to help me stay sane and mentally well. And um, I have an email list that uh, I, about twice a month, I send out an email that's just sort of my musings on what's going on in my life and you know how that relates to my mental health and hopefully a tip about how it might help other people. And it always has, you know, something about running and something about meditation and then something about some of the classes I teach, things like that. But yeah, so the main source is uh, NitaSweeney.com. And then I'm on all the social media channels. I have a couple of Facebook groups. If you go to uh, uh, NitaSweeney.com, you can find pretty much all that. And I'm on, like I said, uh, the social media channels. Oh, and I'm doing Instagram videos now, the Instagram TV, because they're about two minutes long, where I take the, the dog down into the ravine, that very ravine where I started running. And we talk about meditation and meditation practice and how I incorporate that into my running and walking. Excellent. Well, Nita, it's been good to talk to you. And it's really amazing that you've been able to help yourself like this and you're helping others. And, and thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for the work you're doing, too. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about mental health. And thank you for the opportunity. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.